You know it's strange, if you picked up an ordinary looking rock from the ground, you'd never expect it to hold enough energy to power cities or destroy them. But that's exactly the story of uranium, a metal so dense, so powerful, and so rare in human history that it quietly shaped the 20th century, rewrote geopolitical borders, and still fuels debates about the future of energy. Today, I want to take you on a journey from deep underground where uranium begins its quiet life, to the complex labs where it's transformed into nuclear fuel, to the factories where it's shaped into pellets smaller than your fingerprint, yet capable of lighting up thousands of homes. But the real question is, how is uranium actually made? Not the weapon version, not the movie version, the real scientific process, step by step. Because behind all the drama, all the politics, and all the fear, there's a surprisingly simple story of geology, chemistry, engineering, and one rock that changed everything. When I talk about how uranium is made, I don't mean a factory. I mean Earth itself is the factory. Uranium was forged billions of years ago inside exploding stars, supernovae. Those stellar explosions scattered heavy elements across the universe, and eventually some of that cosmic dust became our planet. As Earth cooled, uranium sank into the crust, hiding inside minerals like uraninite. Over millions of years, water, heat, and pressure gathered these minerals into pockets, forming the deposits we mine today in places like Kazakhstan, Canada, and Australia. So technically, uranium is older than Earth, and we're just discovering what to do with it. Once a deposit is identified, the real process begins. There are three main mining methods, and each one makes you appreciate the complexity of extracting a rock with so much potential. Open pit mining. This is used when the ore lies close to the surface. Massive trucks and excavators dig out huge pits, removing rock layer by layer. Underground mining. When ore sits deep below, miners carve tunnels and shafts, similar to gold mines. In situ leaching, or ISL. This is the most modern and surprisingly gentle method. Imagine pumping a special chemical solution into the ground, dissolving uranium right where it sits, and then pumping the uranium-rich liquid back up. It avoids blasting, tunneling, or digging giant pits. By the time the ore reaches the surface, it's still just rock. Not glowing, not dangerous to look at, just rock. Now comes the part where chemistry takes over. At a processing mill, the ore enters giant crushers that turn it into powder. This powder is mixed with acidic or alkaline solutions to dissolve the uranium. What's left, after filtering and drying, is a bright mustard yellow powder called yellow cake, or scientifically, uranium oxide, U-308. If you've ever seen documentaries about nuclear programs, this is the stuff they show being scooped into drums. It's not nuclear fuel yet, not even close, but it's pure enough to begin the next stage. Yellow cake is packed into barrels, labeled carefully, and shipped to conversion plants. And that's where things get interesting. To use uranium in most nuclear power plants, it needs to be enriched, which means increasing the amount of the rare isotope U-235. But enrichment machines can only work with gas, so the solid yellow cake is chemically converted into a gas called uranium hexafluoride, or UF6. UF6 is unique. At room temperature, it's a solid. When heated slightly, it turns into a gas, and when cooled, it returns to a crystal-like solid again. Inside steel cylinders, it looks almost like frost, but this frost is what powers nuclear reactors around the world. Natural uranium contains only 0.7% U-235, but reactors meet about 3 to 
To separate the lighter U-235 from the heavier U-238 atoms, UF-6 gas is fed into machines called gas centrifuges. Think of it like spinning a bucket of mixed sand and feathers. The feathers move towards the center and the sand moves outward. Centrifuges do the same thing but at tens of thousands of rotations per minute. Long chains of these machines, called cascades, gradually increase the U-235 concentration. By the end, we have reactor-grade uranium, still nowhere near weapon-grade, but perfect for energy production. After enrichment, the US-6 gas is turned back into a solid. It's converted into uranium dioxide powder, then pressed into small cylindrical pellets. Each pellet is about the size of a fingertip, but holds as much energy as one ton of coal. These pellets are baked at extremely high temperatures in a furnace, becoming dark ceramic-like pieces ready for assembly. Pellets are loaded into zirconium alloy tubes, strong metals that don't corrode easily inside reactors. These tubes are sealed and bundled into long fuel rods. Then dozens of rods are arranged into square or hexagonal structures called fuel assemblies. These are what nuclear power plants slide into the reactor core. Once inside, they release a controlled chain reaction that boils water, drives turbines, and lights up cities, from hospitals to homes. What's fascinating is that only a small fraction of uranium's potential energy is used in a reactor. Most of it remains unused inside spent fuel rods. That's why the future of uranium isn't just mining, it's recycling, reprocessing, and even next-generation reactors that can use this leftover energy. So the story of uranium is still unfolding, a story that began in exploding stars and may guide the next century of clean energy. So the next time you hear about uranium, nuclear energy, or reactor technology, you'll know the real journey behind it, from cosmic birth, to hidden underground veins, to yellow cake, gas, pellets, and finally pure electricity. A simple rock with a history more dramatic than any movie script. If you enjoyed this deep dive into how uranium is made, do me a favor. Like the video, share it with someone curious, and subscribe to Simple Things Surprising Histories for more stories about the everyday things that secretly changed our world. Thanks for watching. See you in the next episode.